Welcome to the Crowdsource Politics Podcast. This is a live episode where we will be talking about Bernie or bust, or how not to bust, and what moderate Democrats and liberals alike can do in order to ensure that progressives, should they be able to, vote for Biden. I am joined today with Art Black. So am I right? Uh, Mateo de Gaulle, who's below me. Hey, Mateo, what's going on, man? Hey, what's up? And Nicoletta Adams, who's down at the lower left, lower left right here. Hello. Hey, y'all. And we are the Crowdsource Politics Podcast crew. So, Art, before we went live, uh, what were you saying about the uh, the title? Oh, uh, uh, what was I saying about the title? Uh, just think about baseball. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah, I'm not ready for uh, any kind of lineup or joke on that. So it's uh, I just didn't realize what the title was, and I'm like, oh, that has a bit of a double meaning. So exactly. <laughs> um, are are we live? Yes, we're live. Okay, so <laughs> since we're new, just getting started, um, it doesn't look like your background is up. Uh, what do you oh, mean? That, by that's what he chose. He chose green. I'm sorry. Black. You have a green screen, but no, no, no. Unless you're watching on, unless you're watching on Facebook or Twitch, you actually don't see my background. If you're watching me through the Discord, you oh. only see my green screen. Okay, and just another technical thing, we seem to have quite a delay on Twitch. Yeah, the uh, the delay on Twitch is just going to have to be because I'm streaming it to multiple places. It's causing my computer to lag a lot right now. Okay. There's uh the Facebook delay is probably about thirty seconds. The Twitch delay should be about ten seconds. Unless I'm really using up resources. Um, if you are watching us on Facebook, I do suggest you please go over to Twitch. That is twitch.tv slash cloudsourced politics. Uh, on the Twitch channel, I have an easier time to uh, respond to questions as I can have the screen up with your with the chat attached to it already in there and uh when you ask us questions on the twitch channel you'll see some of it come up on the facebook where you'll see the chat come up on it um i'll just do a little message right now hey yeah and you should see a little hey at the bottom of the screen that is the twitch channel's chat coming up and that's how we can monitor questions and you guys can be on air even if you don't want to be uh voice on air we will be taking live questions today um, and if you want to join us at uh, on our Discord, please go ahead and request the Discord link. We can get it to you, and you can join us and have your thoughts and opinions shared with everybody as well. All right. So everybody knows what's been going on for the past two weeks or so, or maybe three, with the whole um, allegations against Joe Biden from Tara Reid, but we are not actually going to talk about that right now. We might actually talk about it tangently since it's part of the uh, the overall conversation. But what we are going to talk about today is the um, is the Bernie or Buster. So do for just initial thoughts, do we think um that they're actually able to we're actually able to convince them to vote for joe biden or do we think it's a lost cause i think most of them are going to vote for joe biden i think uh you know it feels really good to say a lot of these things and there's still a lot of people who are going to just probably not vote because you know the establishment is whatever but i think most people are going to realize the trade-off it's trump or biden like i forget what i said the other day i was like biden could like stomp on baby seals and he'd still i'd pick him over trump mm -hmm. would, would you, just, would you pick sad, him? whether wait sorry <laughs> i was gonna say would you pick him if he shot somebody on fifth avenue <laughs> yep uh i mean it depends who he shot and under <laughs> what circumstances <laughs> but that goes for anyone i guess right for sure or someone fifth I avenue man he stole my gucci belt uh, we are having a couple people ask us for the discord link so i'm going ahead and generate that really quick Invite people, edit invite link. This uh, oh, yeah. Discord link will only be available for one hour. So please go ahead and I'm dropping it inside the Facebook chat right now on the page, not in the group. I can't do the group right now. I'm using too many um, resources. In fact, I'm going to end up having to stop streaming it to Facebook because the video is just awful, to be honest. 
It is just, it is dragging bad. I don't even think you guys can hear us, to be honest. Can you change the bit rate? No, though that, you know what? That's probably what it is. The bit rate's probably oh, yeah. the problem because it maxes out. So I'm going to head, guys, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to stop the Facebook stream really quick and we'll start it right back up. Um, hopefully it doesn't uh, cause issues with that, but the bit rate is the problem. It is too high. I, I know that for a fact. So general stream output. Oh, now actually the bit rate's fine for it. It's actually low. Hold on. Should be. Should crank it, it all the way up. No, Facebook limits you to like 4,000 or something. All right, hopefully that will uh, get us back up and going on the Facebook bitrate. We'll see if the video is working or not. Sorry, guys. It's I need a new computer. <laughs> so, uh, so Nikki, you you said that you would vote for Joe Biden if he shot someone in Fifth Avenue. That was said a little tongue in cheek, I'm sure. Um, but uh, <laughs> but what would what would it take? Um, for you to not vote for Joe Biden, is there any way that you would see yourself not voting for him? Absolutely none. Fair enough. Not because I'm a big Biden supporter. I'm not a, what did somebody say yesterday? I'm not a militant Biden supporter. Very odd. Militant. <laughs> militant Biden supporter. I was called that yesterday. Um, but it is, it's a binary choice. We either have fascism or we have a return no not even a return we have a path to go forward as a country gotcha uh mateo we did lose your video um you might have accidentally hit off the yeah, screen no i have no clue this whole thing is a disaster oh well fair enough um so we think that they might eventually vote for joe biden but how sure are we what's the Oh, my dog is having little dreams. What's the uh, what's the likelihood that what's what's the we think is the percentage of people that aren't actually won't vote Joe Biden? I can answer that question because I just looked this up. Unless one of you guys already has it up. I do not have it up. If you want to go ahead and no, I can't get it on the screen in a in a mm. good way. So just yeah, um, we'll we'll skip that. See. One in seven. <laughs> Thank you. And um, we'll talk about one in seven of people that are actually going to vote. If Bernie supporters actually voted, he would have won the primary. Like a lot of these people who are talking about this giant wave of youth that's going to show up. And of course, they've got helicopters and all kinds of nonsense going on. If all these people actually showed up, rather than talking a big game on the internet, you know, it would be one thing. But, you know, apparently he has this large, like, wellspring of youth that post a lot and talk a lot, but don't actually show up to vote. So... I don't know if it matters. Why are we trying to persuade these people that talked a good game? For right. Them? Right, right. I mean, that's a fair point. Like, they didn't come out to vote in the primary, so how can we expect them to come out and vote in the general election? There's also a, um, it ran on the 28th of April, that um, former aides of his are forming a super PAC specifically to support Biden. I think that will make a difference. It's Jeff Weaver and... A woman whose name I, a person whose name I don't have in front of me. Ah. Oh, in, including Chris, Chuck Roca, excuse me, and Tim Tagaris, and Shelley Jackson. Interesting. And Interesting. Mark Longabaugh. So that I would think that that would. Well, let me just start over. I don't think that there are that great a number of Sanders people who will not vote for Biden. I think they're a, they're a rather small group. And anybody who's still kind of on the fence, I think things like this super PAC are going to make a difference. So an interesting thing that I saw in polling is that Trump is starting to make inroads. And by inroads, I mean very minor inroads, you know, a couple of percentage uh, with, you know, certain minority voters, uh, Black, Hispanic, all that. And Biden is starting to make more inroads with uh, older white voters, you know, 65 and older, mm -hmm. uh, you know, white male. So the interesting thing about that is that you think, oh, my, wow, like, you know, Trump making inroads with the minorities. Oh, OK, but they're largely in blue states, whereas the older white male demo is a lot more evenly distributed. 
So it's going to have a lot more of an electoral college effect if Biden can make inroads with older nice. white you know, voters rather Sounds than making inroads with minorities. Making small inroads is just going to be statistical noise. Like it's not really going to flip anything, you know, right. most likely. So this has kind of always been the argument for Biden is that, you know, okay, he's past his prime. He's not really, you know, even in his prime, voters never really selected him to be president. He, this mm-hmm. is his third run now. But he seems to be acceptable to the broadest spectrum of people. And here we are. Oh, for sure. For sure. Thank you, Tyra. Uh, I didn't see the whole uh, name flash across the screen for the follow. We greatly appreciate it. Oh, and we got Dragon Sword as well. Follow. Thanks for the follow, Dragon Sword. Appreciate it. Um, I'm going to go ahead and shut down the Facebook stream. It is just really choppy. I put in the Facebook streams chat, the Twitch streams link which is going to be down below. Um, Mateo, if you could also copy that into the watch party for me. Um, it's it's really, it, the quality is just too poor to be sh- dual streaming. Wait, you want the Twitch link? Yeah, put the, can you, if you put the Twitch link inside the group, uh, the group watch party for us. It, it's, it, it's too bad. It's, I'm losing frames on it really badly. It's super choppy. Facebook's dying anyway. Like right now or just in general? Uh, right now and in general. <laughs> so Facebook people, please go to twitch.tv slash crowdsource politics to continue watching us here. Um, we will, I will cross post it, but if you want to join us live, that's where we're going to be streaming. Sorry. I'm going ahead and end that now. No, make the motherfucker go Twitch. All right. Stopping stream. Okay, Anthony. Yes. We got 10 people on Twitch. Yes, 10 people. Thank you guys so much for joining us on Twitch. We greatly appreciate it. Um, so uh, I think one of the, the things that we should talk about in, in this regard is um, how s- we we, t- we kind of touched on the one in seven number and a little bit about the um, the fact that Biden is appealing more, uh, to more than other people had uh, appealed to the 45 plus 45 and older crowd. Um, how serious do you think the Bernie or Busters actually are right now? Do you think it's a lot of uh, hemming and hawing or do we think it's it's going to be serious and 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 that sort of thing? And again, we're just talking about the busters here. We're not talking about everybody. So just to be very specific, most Bernie supporters are just going to vote for Biden and there's going to be no drama. So of the busters, you have people that weren't Democrats to begin with, or uh, I don't know, maybe some undercover Trumpers who are just trying to agitate. Like there's this weird mix of people who, I don't know where they're coming from ideologically. Like they literally see the Democrats as his, larger problem, or if not a much larger problem than, you know, Trump, not just the GOP, but like, you know, the Uh specific threat of Trump. So I don't really think that some of them can be placated because that's not what they're here for. I mean, they're not even really here to negotiate. They want Bernie or they want it to burn. So this is, again, a very small set of people who probably don't vote anyway. So, you know, they appear bigger than they probably are online because, I don't know, that's just... It's where they are, and it's hard to qual- kind of quantify who these guys are, and some of them are just straight up fake, but a lot of them are real enough that it's kind of cranks. So, right. I, you know, I think that you can expend a lot of energy trying to chase down these individual cranks who aren't really motivated by anything other than ideology. And a lot of times it's a really nice ideology. Like they've got policies and good things that they want for America, and they can objectively say that the stuff that we're advocating for is much better than what Biden's going to get you. And I get that. And I mean, if that was a realistic way of looking at the world, then, you know, yeah, I'd be all for it. But, you know, that's not how our system works. And when you get to this phase of things, if you haven't persuaded enough people, then you kind of have felt fallen off and you no longer get to make your arguments in your lane because your lane has collapsed. And there's no lane there anymore. You just now have it narrowed to these two lanes. So people that don't like that framing and say, well, I'll just vote third party then. I don't care. Okay. I mean, I can't placate you or convince you. If you mm-hmm. 
you can't do math and you don't realize that a third party votes a wasted vote in most cases, then, you know, uh, I don't know what to tell you other than, uh, you know, <laughs> Learn how the voting system like, works. <laughs> Trump wins. I mean, yeah. We, right. Yeah, that's uh, it's a good good thing you brought that up because I actually did a small video about uh, the different voting systems and why why ours is in particularly crap. And I know a lot of Democrats already agree with that, partly because Trump won, partly because Bush won. Let's be real, um, but it is um, it is a very bad voting system, and uh, we should change it. Um, Mateo, what are your thoughts on 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 this on the uh, how serious the uh, the busters might be? I think it comes in stages. I think most of them, like I said earlier, they're going to be reasonable. They're going to vote against Donald Trump because let's face it, if you're a Bernie fan, your interests align a lot more with uh, Democrats than it does anyone else. So Mm -hmm. most of them are going to end up voting for Biden. And the few that actually bust are people who probably never would have voted Democrat anyway. Gotcha. No, that makes sense to me too. Well, um, if that's the case, then I guess there's, I don't know. I, I want to say that we can still convince a lot of these, these people um, to, to ultimately vote Biden, even if they don't really want to. And, and I think it comes, some of it comes down to tone, maybe. Um, there's been a lot of complaints from the the people who I uh, I interact with online that are that are definitely Bernie or Busters or uh, you know general progressives that don't care for the Democratic Party think the DNC is a corrupt organization that stole Bernie's chance in 2016 and again in 2020 um, and their number one complaint seems to be not so much the corruption of the DNC but how we as general liberal supporters of the democratic party treat them has that been anybody else's um experience i get a lot of um I, a flack because i will not beg for people's votes this isn't a, it's never been personal for me it's about, to me it's about the country so the country is begging for your vote i don't beg for votes if you're if you're a contrarian and you're not going to vote, well, then you're not going to vote. I'm going to move on and talk to somebody else. Okay, fair point. Art, you're on a lot of uh, in a lot of groups, kind of some of the similar ones that I'm in. Is that been your exp- is my experience similar to your experience, or do you think that's just bluster? Uh, in regards to um, whether or not it's how people, excuse me. Whether or not it's how people, how they get treated by general liberal supporters or not. You mean like Hillary supporters were mean to me, so I'm going to vote for ethnofascism? Yes. Yes, exactly. Uh, yeah, I mean, some people say that, but, you know, it's, it's the same thing where like, you know, people will get upset at like, you know, Bernie bros for being mean. They're like, well, I'm not going to vote for Bernie because his supporters are jerks. Uh, okay. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't really know how to take that super seriously other than some people say it, but I think a lot of that whole like respectability politics and like, you know, you need to always, you know, conduct yourselves, you know, perfectly. And if not, then I'm going to take great offense to it is actually backwards to how we're wired. Like if you think about like, if you're accused of some crime you didn't commit, you know, naturally you kind of get angry and you're like, no, Mm -hmm. hell no, I didn't do that. No, that's, that's, that's mess. That's not right. Like you get personally angry and offended and we're kind of wired to see that kind of reaction, that kind of passion as legitimate. So right. like if you have some kind of righteous need to be angry, then we're a bit hardwired to take that a lot more seriously. Whereas, you know, like, and this is kind of the issue with like the Biden Tara Reid thing is, is, is it Tara or Tara? I never know. I think it's Tara. Okay. So Tara Reid is going to uh, see what I did there. <laughs> triggering this interesting like I don't know quite how to put it but like if you look at how Trump deals with you know sexual harassment allegations he's basically like nah they're lying they're crazy they're uh and he's totally angry and dismissive and even though he's a complete jerk about it and probably lying 
that's kind of how we're wired to, you know, see things as far as like when you're actually innocent, you just act in a certain way and people are like, well, you know, he kind of acts like he's really aggrieved and angry. Mm -hmm. Whereas you kind of get lawyerly and you are careful with your words. It seems like you're lying. It seems like you're trying to parse things and be really defensive and like exactly what Biden's doing. He's doing the, the corporate professional way that we're kind of taught, which is, you know, if you have to respond to this kind of allegation, you know, don't be a sexist pig about it. Right. Yep. You know, be, you know, magnanimous, be, you know, uh, patient and understanding and all the kind of things that we are naturally not when we're falsely accused. So mm -hmm. unfortunately, what we're trained to do is also seen as deceptive. Right. Yeah. No, so makes, that's, that's a weird sense. thing that we're struggling with now. And it's the same thing with political passion. Like you get people who get fired up and angry. Like if you're righteously aggrieved, you should be angry. Like you should be, you know, taking the tea and throwing it in the harbor and, you know, F you, King George. Like we're taught that that's the right reaction when the situation warrants it and when the cause is right. So that's that weird thing in our politics where we're constantly telling people to simmer down. You know, Black Lives Matter, you guys need to calm down. Like the whole point of it is because we're trying to say that what you're getting mad about is not worth getting mad about. You're, this isn't a legitimate political angle. So this is this constant dance that we do with each other to tell the other side to calm down and not act so aggrieved. It's on one hand, like a respectability thing, but it's also yeah. to understand how valid their point is. If that makes any sense. No, it makes, it makes a lot of sense. I, I kind of agree with that, but I do, I do have a, uh, I have this thing where I'm very much aware that for, for some people, and I don't know how many people it is. I can't, I don't have empirical data to, to go with this. So just take it as the opinion that it is that voting is an exercise in, um, well, it's not virtue signaling, but it's social, social cohesion, social posturing, where a lot of people are are like they live in a certain community. Every all their friends vote a certain way. All their friends are a certain political ilk, or all their um, everybody they know is is kind of similar minded, and so they tend to you know go with not go with the flow to for lack of a better better term about it and a lot of people are very much put off by first impressions and of course our first impressions are definitely um are definitely influenced by our own biases and, and that sort of thing and, and it just seems to me that like i don't know like do you have to be a dick i mean like it, it does put people off to a degree and you know if I I, ha I have to catch myself because you know I actually you know worked worked with or working with an o our revolution group in Texas, and um, I've had people not knowing that I'm ex-military saying you know milit anybody that joins the military now is 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 an idiot or or what have you, and yeah like well. <laughs> But uh, they try to make it this like moral thing where if you join the military, if you join the military since 9-11, um, so or since at least the Iraq war, then you're either you're either super dumb or you don't care at all about American foreign policy idiot things and we shouldn't cater to you like whatsoever. And I'm sitting here like, dude, I'm standing right here. Right. But I, I know I don't let that influence me, but I know other people will be influenced by it. Okay, I can see that. Mateo, just do you have do you do you see something do you see some things similar to the way I see it or what's what's up? Uh yeah, actually the way you put it was kind of exactly it for a lot of them. Um it's it's not anti patriotic, but it's like it's almost like this weird like identity to always be like a foil to you know, like the right wingers have the deep state. These people have the military industrial complex. It's always some sort of like group of faceless suits that it's not definable at all. They just, it's almost like a rant against nobody. <laughs> and that lands on the military with these guys. Or the wealthy or the 1% or the, right. you know, there's always a, it doesn't matter. Yeah, right. Are, yeah, like when a rich person's rights are violated, they're like, oh, boo hoo. It's like, where the fuck? <laughs> like, what, what do you think rights are for? 
But you I got think more money. Right. You think you just cry with it? <laughs> oh man, so absurd! You got all this money. Anyways, yeah, I get completely get what you're saying. Oh, somebody joined us. Who is it that just hopped in? Um, Hi, I don't care to... Tash. <laughs> oh, Tashimoto. Oh, hey, how are you doing? Um, good. Just, no, no harm, no foul. But please, next time, message one of us to let us know that you're you're going to be joining, just so that uh, things don't get moved around unexpectedly. Tashimoto, I, thank you for I joining did this us. To somebody one time. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Did you? <laughs> uh, Mateo accident actually accidentally crashed one of the bigger names on Twitch, uh, Mind Waves TV. Uh, they were having their little big brain politics podcast thing, and uh, he he was talking <laughs> during their live thing, and they booted him. It was kind of funny. Uh, but uh, what what brings you to join us today? Um, it's a Saturday, and um, I thought I'd listen to. Thank about Bernie and um, the that is American politics. For sure. Uh, Art, did you want to cool. chime in with something? I saw you wave. Oh, uh, we had a comment in chat, but also before I get to that real quick. So what you're talking about as far as like political identity, I think what, yeah. the thing about uh, it's more of a Democrat-Republican split on how we look at this sort of thing, but Republicans are a lot less sentimental as far as like who they hire as long as it's a white guy like this, <laughs> it, 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 I'm kind of kidding but also no I, I no i know yep. you know gop politicians at a national level pretty much all male pretty much all white i mean with a handful tiny handful of exceptions but past that it doesn't really mean much whereas with democrats they tend to be a lot more uh, attuned to how the president reflects on them personally like it's almost like a personal symbol and so like with somebody like obama they're very proud of him personally or they liked uh you know clinton personally or even like with carter you know he was a very moral and you know upstanding guy so wasn't very you know, president but you know a good person so whereas with republicans they like them but it's almost more of like a i don't know kind of having like like you have a sports team and you just have some players that are really good and you're kind of proud of those players but you don't really have that same connection. I think okay. it's a little bit of a different thing with Democrats as far as how they personally like place a lot of their hopes and dreams and like make that layered onto a, a politician. So Biden's kind of like a weird throwback in that regard, and that he's not particularly one that they you know see much reflection in. I guess it's more of like a it's a, finally they're getting functional and they're saying, hey, you know what? His numbers are better than that guy's numbers. Like, screw all you guys. Like, you almost could have seen, like, in different cycles, they could have gone for, like, a Buttigieg or somebody that's a little bit different because the Democrats like falling in love. Like, they like a bit of the excitement and romance as far as mm -hmm. a new uh, another white male. Right. <laughs> well, yeah, but he's young and he's got a weird last yeah. name and he's gay. Oh, he is they gay. Been taken out I mean, it's not the 90s anymore, though. <laughs> now we've got a, a you know a very interesting resume, but you know that's all I'm saying is you tend to have these more interesting Democrats, and you tend to have Republicans who it's like, well, it's my turn. Like, you know, I'm Bob Dole. I've been in the party for 483 years, so I was. A <laughs> yeah, that didn't work. That didn't really work out too well for Hillary Clinton. It's my turn. No, no, no it's not. Well, <laughs> I mean, it really should have been her turn. It was kind of a fluke <laughs> yeah. how this all played out. It's true. Yeah. Uh, it's it's funny because it's traditionally more of a GOP thing where you kind of have this hierarchy in this organization. It's a very conservative thing. You think about paying your dues and you're a good, you know, line trooper and you get moved up the ranks and eventually everybody else kind of dies off and you're the dinosaur that's left and it's your turn. So that's served them really well. And they're almost changing that a bit to getting to this point where like the Democrats are like, look, like screw all this like hope and change and all that. Like we just need like numbers, like who's going to like win this? Like that's getting weirdly a lot more important to them. Whereas right. the GP is getting to this point where they're like, no, like we need somebody exciting. Like it's pizzazz. Give me that. Who's that real estate dude that had the TV show? Like, let's try that guy. We, like, we want somebody with balls. Like I can't tell you yeah. how many times I heard that um, he while in the military. Yeah. So we, we get pushed around too much. Shut up. Yeah. Well, these Reno's are rolling over for uh, these, you know, Democrats and God, yeah. Democrats. 
Demon, Demon Crafts. Crafts. Oh, there's, there's so many different puns that are all oh, yeah. like C minus quality at best. <laughs> but, you know. But uh, anyway, I think that that's just kind of an interesting thing because for most of our lives, it's been the GOP that's been very hierarchical right. and very attuned to whose turn it is and who's got the best numbers for this and just uh, a very boring way of looking at it. Just it's kind of more about effectiveness. And it's been the Democrats that have been a little more, let's say, lofty thinkers and risk takers. And, you know, in certain ways, that's changing. And uh, it's just we're in right. a new phase in a lot of ways. And that's just one of them. No, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Uh, we did have somebody uh, pipe in the chat um, that cor- that told me what the the definite the uh, term I was looking for. So it's social identity. Um hmm tend to place our value in the group in which we belong. The stronger that identity is, the more impact in-group, out-group influences we'll have on our political behavior and everything else. So great point. Thank you for making it. I see that Mateo actually chimed in there and, and let you know, but I just wanted to get that on air it's for anybody. Who might be. So. Yeah, She's good. really smart. Who is that commenter? Right. Is that I your daughter? That all the time. <laughs> 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 See, I, I I figured I figured it was, it but I am terrible. I, say at, <laughs> I am terrible at pronouncing her. people's names. So Galadriel. Um, I did, Galadriel. Galadriel. Galadriel, thank you for uh, for doing that. Tashimoto, I am sorry that we we kind of talked over you a little bit. Please, what what how do you think this is going so far? And please give us your thoughts. If I do ask you to repeat yourself, it's because you are breaking up on my end. Yeah, um, we, in my country, we gave up first past the post a long time ago and for reasons of its inherent suckiness and tendency to um, just general. So, yeah, like it, it, it doesn't seem to be that great. And which country are you from? Oh, New Zealand. New Zealand. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, yeah, there was a. You must be one of the three or four people from New Zealand that actually listens to the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it's great, though. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I'm glad that you come on. Yeah, um, I, I very much am anti first past the post winner take all uh, voting systems. I am personally for ranked choice voting. I think it's the simpler of the ones that actually gets to what I like. Uh, but, you know, first uh, ranked choice voting, yeah. approval voting, range voting, they all kind of. Um, they all kind of, you know, do that, the get rid of the whole spoiler effect thing to different degrees. So, yeah, definitely agree with that. Um, and that's one of the things, though. I think a lot of a lot of um, the the Bernie or Busters, uh, they they don't put emphasis on it much. It mm-hmm. seems like they um, they care more about their own personal sense of morality as opposed to taking a utilitarian kind of consequentialist perspective where, well, my vote, if I vote for X, that means Y will happen. And it, trying to discuss this issue with people that, that are just, they just put that primacy on like, I can't damn my soul for anything. Uh, it seems futile to me, but one, yeah, one, one guy. <laughs> <laughs> can you, can you say again, Tashimoto? Um, yeah, it does seem really futile. And I think you're right where the problem is the system where like, you know, you need a system where the people who would vote Bernie just Bernie actually can vote Bernie and have him in and their representation happen. Like we've got mixed member proportional representation here, which kind of means that if you want to grow, vote green, then mm-hmm. green actually to represent you, you know? So like, I mean, I tend to, and it, means that you know you can support more than one party yeah but like if there's if one of them's a mainstream party that you kind of like but they're kind of disappointing on certain levels you can sort of vote in the party that you'd really want to to sort of keep them honest and it seems to work a little bit better no for sure definitely definitely like i said i am very much pro ranked choice voting um or or any of the kind of things i i do 
that that could be its own separate podcast. In fact, it kind of was. I did do a little PowerPoint presentation for about uh, 30 minutes the other day. So it's on this channel here. You can go to the previous videos and uh, watch it if you'd like. Um, I can also re-give it uh, should anybody in the group want to get into a one-on-one uh, -on -one discussion with it or, or ask me questions while I'm live uh, for anybody that missed it uh, yesterday. Yeah, it certainly worked for uh, New Zealand. It seems like... Yeah. Uh, uh, I want to call her Jacinda Arden. The I do. Your prime minister is just killing it. I mean, just across the board. Yeah, uh, she is great. <laughs> like in politics today, so. Yeah, <laughs> I'm pretty happy to be here right now. Got to say. Yeah, no, it's clearly a, a more efficient system than ours, and we have this weird structure where our system has been extremely stable. I mean, for being one of the youngest countries around, we're one of the oldest non, uh, you know, transferred governments. I mean, we're basically the same government we were, you know, 200 plus years ago. And that stability has been useful in some ways, but it's also been severely limiting in others. And you can see we're kind of, I don't know, we're like a, a kid that's outgrown their clothes and they're starting to not fit anymore. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I think it's sort of a, engenders a bit of a born to rule kind of an attitude amongst the political class yeah like you know that you know i've been in the party for x amount of years and therefore i should be president next whereas like you know most people wouldn't have a chance of being president ever you know mm -hmm. right huh. is no no problem um so nickel nikki you've been uh quiet a little bit what are your thoughts about the uh the issue of the people that put primacy on their own sense of uh, moral self-worth above the consequences of their uh, what their vote means do you think there's a way that we can actually break through to them or do you also think it is a uh exercise in futility I think, and I don't know if it's just that it's happened over the course of the last three years where this partisan divide has become so fraught, but the people that I've talked to who say that it's a moral choice, they can't possibly vote for mm -hmm. Biden because he doesn't meet their moral center or whatever, they're obstinately shut down. Gotcha. Doesn't matter that he has an incredibly progressive uh, platform. His policy positions are really progressive, truly, over the course of the whole democratic field, <laughs> this is the most progressive platform we've seen, but it doesn't matter. If it's not Medicare for all, mm. no private insurance, everybody gets free health care, then it doesn't matter what his health plan is. Yeah, I, I do think that uh, Bernie Sanders has largely um, won the policy argument, if not necessarily the nuts and bolts argument. If that's a good way to kind of look at it, like broadly speaking, Democrats are roughly on the same side of expanding healthcare access, of making it not tied to work as much as it is. Most Democrats, in my experience, have been are now 100 uh, percent in favor of at least a public option um, and that sort of thing. Uh, Art, you wanted to break in. Please go ahead. Oh, um, yeah. So one of the things I was going to say is that. I think what they misunderstand about our system is that they get locked into this game theory kind of a, a paradigm where they think that if we compromise, that's going to encourage more compromise, it's going to encourage more compromise. And the natural result of that is that everything will get pulled to the right forever. Because if you compromise to the right, you get pulled to the right. And that only incentivizes more of that action. And the problem with that just what should occur to anybody is that if you're stuck in a two-party system, that's not necessarily going to pull you to the right. Like that's just not mm -hmm. how it works. But they are convinced that if you compromise to the right, there can be no other reaction, but for everything to be pulled to the right, it just moves you over to the window to the right. Just that's the only possible outcome. And they don't look at it as them compromising to the left. Cause they're like, well, they never, they never compromise to the left. It never happens. No, for sure. Yeah, um, got, right wing ideas are so good that they'll just be so irresistible <laughs> to everyone. <laughs> Well, mm, give like me we can't give in. Everyone will love it then. Right. Ah! Well, they get behind playing both sides of the field. And, you know, it's like, uh, okay, like St. Andrew of Breitbart used to say, politics is down to <laughs> So once you have this kind of cultural understanding that this is the way things should be, 
it influences the political parties because people are just naturally going to gravitate towards the arguments that have already won out among the people. To, politics can drive that to an extent, but also culture, when it has a natural change, will just naturally change you know, the actions of politicians. So with our system where you have presidential elections every four years, the way you actually change things is to have arguments that win in the off season. So you've got three and a half or however long years, well, at this point, it's almost like two and a half years of non uh, you know, electoral politics where you can make these arguments. And even in the you know, election season, you can persuade, you can change minds, and you can kind of create this idea where both sides agree on this. And that just creates everybody heading in a certain direction. What these guys don't like is that they feel like because their argument is correct, they don't need to negotiate. They don't want to persuade. They want to get their way or they don't see the point in doing any more work. Like they're just done. And when you look at something like Medicare for all, you can say, look, every country in the world's figured this out. Like we'd nuke Japan twice and they figured this out. Like mm -hmm. we, can say we can't make it work. Everybody else can make it work. You got tiny countries, big countries, everybody makes it work. So what are we doing that says that we can't make it work? It's a good argument. I get it. You've persuaded me, but the problem is we haven't persuaded enough people out there. So yeah. you can go to the next round. You got to take me and get this round and go on to the next round. Keep making your arguments. I feel the same way about like UBI. Now I know I'm in the small minority, but okay. So if I don't get Andrew Yang this year, I'm not going to vote. Like it's just stupid. <laughs> you know, it's it's For idiotic. Sure. Like you can't look at this stuff in like the long term. And unfortunately, we've been super propagandized to believe that certain things are impossible. Like even right now, printing out trillions of dollars just to keep the economy afloat was the stuff that they swore was impossible. We'd crash everything. We'd have we'd be Zimbabwe. You know, runaway inflation, hyperinflation. And now we're just like, oh, it's fine. Yeah. So people just believe things that are not true. And until you persuade them otherwise, you're just kind of stuck with it. You just do the best you can in the framework that you can work with until you persuade more people. And then every four years, you get a chance to make that argument again. But if you don't make it, then you got to settle for what's best at the time. And people hate to be told that you got to compromise, you got to settle. You got to compromise, you got to settle. Mm -hmm. For that's, sure, that's that's supposed. <laughs> it comes down to like um, just how much they understand, like how relative their views really are. Like they'll speak in terms, like they'll tell everyone else that they know what their best interests are. It's just absolutely absurd. Yeah, I think a lot of uh, it, it's the it's the whole kind of thing of well, I'm convinced I'm morally right. Why don't you see it? kind of thing i think it's it's like well my moral argument convinced me it should convince you and that's just not how people operate people have different yeah, they view the world views. through their own lenses and they don't yeah. realize that other people have other lenses they they just think that they're dumb or missing something like they yeah. can never uh, like explain it in a rational way sometimes sure. they are dumb and missing something i don't want to act like exactly. you know it's always a misunderstanding right yeah no i mean for sure like we we're not we're not necessarily we're not we're not uh, trying to talk down to anybody but if you're coming at this from an angle of uh, <laughs> art is of course but if you're coming at this from an angle of uh moral moral uh ing indignation you're just going to turn people off i mean i don't know how many people i've met that stopped being christian because you know some christian said you know try to like moralize them about something that they they were into and just be like well i can't do this anymore then screw you and i i look at it the same way um, part of the problem is that political ideology is becoming an important, as important as identity as race. It's undeniable, undeniable. Uh, and with Bernie and Trump, populism breeds the counterintuitive agenda that almost seems to deliberately aim to shoot themselves in the proverbial foot if they can't get what they want, even if that agenda isn't actually possible in its entirety. Yeah, I can agree with that. You definitely agree with that. When you think about it, they're just very bad moral entrepreneurs. Like they got the morality <laughs> part down, but they're not very uh, savvy, like uh, bargaining any other way. They 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 didn't read or misunderstood Saul Alansky and uh, have taken the the ideas that he presented and put it uh, backwards. 
Well, a lot of the point of moral entrepreneurship is to build up the kind of capital that you can expend socially. So it doesn't really even matter if what you believe is true or not. It matters if a lot of people in your group believe it and they'll reward you for believing it. Right. So trying to, to raise money, you know, by saying whatever you know, crazy stuff your particular group wants you to say and whoever you've identified with and latched onto, you know, that's just survival programming. I mean, we're just taught to kind of adapt to our situation and go through whatever emotions are necessary. And then to the extent that you start believing that and internalize it. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's okay. just a marketplace like any other. It's just uh, the marketplace of ideas. They just suck at it. <laughs> they never buy anything. They, they always lose. They on the never bridge. buy anything. That's <laughs> excellent. Yes. <laughs> I shouldn't say nice. always lose, but you know what I mean. It's just. I, I think we. They, very. I'm, yeah. I would, yeah. I, I couldn't. I couldn't agree with the always lose thing because I do think a lot of uh, at least. Uh, yeah currently a lot of the their ideas are coming to light or not to light i'm sorry coming to the forefront is the correct word to, uh, correct i think word they're getting a for. shout out more than they're really getting pushed out there like democrats are pretty notorious for going right back to the center when elections well, are over well i think the but what's the center right now for democrats fight for 15 had a lot of success i think they considered fight Biden for 15 the center. well and, but Biden fight is, for 15 no that's that's probably too much for center democrats oh, are, are you I, it's sure? hard to be that general because it think seems so, yeah. like i think a lot of the democrats kind of buy into the whole 15 dollars a living wage is, is moral and 15 dollars is the living wage that's my, oh, okay. my experience but i mean i might know, be wrong person yeah. i don't have anything to really back it up there so i'm not just gonna i'm just gonna drop it <laughs> <laughs> i mean that's fair i have a comment from rarely wrong who says you guys all sound smart you're not the american electorate <laughs> oh man uh, uh. I just play a smart guy on the internet <laughs> wow rarely wrong thank you for the uh, the, the, the compliment that it's very sad on its face <laughs> it is. according it to is Pew two thirds of Americans favor raising the minimum wage to 15 so yeah. I think I'm more than just a little bit wrong <laughs> two thirds that's more than I was expecting wow. so yeah, uh, and, and it's going to end with COVID crisis. It's probably going to be even more because you have all these people right now getting hero worship, um, the kind of trying to uh, mythologize, I guess. Would that be it? I don't know. I, I don't know. Well, I know no, where I'm going. Not, I don't even they're, think they're, it's that deep. I think it's just like, you know, they're realizing that these people are, they don't make a lot. <laughs> and right, now like, but, they're actually pretty like central to the now. economy. It's being it's being very clear the how essential to the economy that they are, and you know you do have this like hero worship going around them that you usually see kind of reserved for people to go fight on to go to fight and die in wars, especially in the Amer in America where um, they are being basically they're being like oh well shit like they do need a living wage like they're risking their life now I'm like yeah but why does it take this to you know it's it's just one of those things. Also, because a living wage in New Jersey and New it's York isn't going to be the same in Alabama, so fifteen might Correct. be a good idea for a lot of the country, but it might be too much for a lot of areas. So it'll have to be tweaked out. And a lot of people are really firm about that fifteen number. Where that came from, I don't even know. I think if they just like Bernie Sanders, oh, nice Bernie round. Did it? Bernie. I think so. It, it wasn't. It wasn't just Bernie the Sanders. Of the it's, year. it's. Uh, uh -huh. I think it's the split difference between what per where uh, productivity if wages kept pace with productivity it's the uh, i think it's come from that it's the half of that number now art's shaking his head and i'm wrong what, what is it from right it, it's because it's a round number okay it would be no, somewhere it, it around there double, though. and it's double where the last time it was raised to yeah yeah but if, uh, yeah. You know, like they asked andrew yang about this like why'd you pick a thousand dollars he's like oh it's because it's a round number it's, it's like, easy we to remember yeah. or, you know on tw you know 10 12 or whatever but no 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 you know, people grasp round numbers. 15, nice and clean. I think it is somewhere around 15. It might be higher, though, like 18, 19, maybe. I'm not even sure. But um, The the productivity one, I think, is 32. Oh, okay. But if then again, I mean, why why should wages track general productivity anyway? Just because they used that to. That can be a whole nother episode. <laughs> yeah, because there's a lot of things that contribute to productivity that aren't yeah. humans anymore. Yep.
So there's a real good reason why those aren't tracking anymore. But um, so we kind of talked around about uh, everything. What what do we think we can do? That was what this episode was ultimately supposed to be about. So is there anything that we think we could do in order to help convince um, Bernie or Busters or, or people that are on the fence from voting Joe Biden that are generally liberal to voting for Joe Biden? Can we stop for one second before we do that? Dragon Swords made a couple of comments here. Uh, for sure. Yeah, go for it. Okay. Uh, I see. think a lot of highly ideological people also hear bits and pieces about their opponents and put those pieces together in an order that makes their opponent as bad as possible instead of checking to see if they heard what they think they heard. Oh, okay. I have a warrant officer that swears Bernie wants a 70% tax on the middle class. He won't show me where he saw it. He heard it, and therefore it's the gospel truth. I've searched, and the best that I can find is 52% on income in excess of $10 million. Totally middle class. <sighs> the it 70%. Comes back down to in groups. Yeah, the 70% number. number the 70% number is harks back to just after the, the, uh, the Second World War, I'm sure. I'm sure the people were like, well, we had a 70% tax rate. Um, Back That's then, and it didn't, too, which kills yeah, yeah, me. yeah. We had seventy percent back then. Uh, why can't we have it again? And I'm sure that's what he heard. And it's not not that like I, it's what I he mean, want. you don't have to agree with the seventy percent number, or even something like ninety or something. But at the same yeah. time, you have to realize there's a difference between just taking seventy percent of what someone made in a year yeah. and having brackets step up. Yeah, as right. your income steps up, and and that's the thing. A lot of people on uh, art. I didn't hear you at all. If you had tried to say something, you broke up really bad. Okay. Um, a lot of people on on the right tend to, you know, say they take half of my paycheck. I'm like, no, they don't. What are you <laughs> talking about? Like, well, actually, what? after you add state and local and everything, it does That's, turn out to be a pretty it, surprising a, number. Maybe they're it is about a that. big number. It, it it could they could be talking about that. But when I'm like, federal taxes are X. You're no way in hell you're paying that much in taxes. Like, yes, I am. I'm like, okay, dude. Like, yeah, they just did some <laughs> real simple math. They're like, ah. Thank like, you right. for, so for the Obama. comments, by the way. Yes, and Tasha, yeah, Moto, awesome thank you for joining us too, uh, as well. If anybody else would like to join us on on the stream uh, here to share their thoughts and opinions with the wider audience, uh, besides what's in chat, feel free to go ahead and uh, join us in Discord. I dropped the link inside the stream chat, so you can feel free to join us on Discord if you should desire. Good point. It's easier, it's easier to convince, to convince someone of a lie than convince yeah. someone that they believe is truth isn't the best. Especially. So, yeah, I'd say especially. Very, it's easier to convince somebody of a lie than it is to convince them that they've been lied to. Yep. Right. Because then they are a sucker. Right. Like they will double down on whatever they were fooled by rather than admit that they got suckered. And this is something that you run into in, in like sales. Like I, for instance, just recently had a competitor that was marketing something that was completely not true. They're basically saying that, you know, hey, you know, I, you know, among other things, do property management. And they were saying, hey, if you go with us, we've got all these like first responders and nurses and people who are here to fight COVID. And, you know, we'll put them up in your property because right now everything's like dead. Like it's a tourist right. town. And the thing is, that wasn't true. Like it was just a total lie. They just made it up. But like you had all these desperate people out here who were completely screwed because of COVID-19 killing the tourist industry. So they flocked to this, uh, you know, this kind of management company and got completely screwed. Like they just, they all showed up and they're like, oh, well, we don't actually have anybody, uh, but we might in a couple months. So at that point, you're like, well, why is anybody even still there? But a lot of them are just like, well, you know, they, they didn't, they didn't mean to de deceive us. It just, you know, they just ran out of people kind of a thing. I'm like, Ugh, they, okay. Suck, but some people Fool me get, once. Get Shame on <laughs> you. Fool me twice. Can't get fooled again. <laughs> right. <sighs> it's just wild, though, when you see people who get suckered and then they just won't admit they got suckered and they just keep doubling down and doubling down. Oh, has anybody noticed for... The last couple of weeks, at least, people who are actually Trump supporters will say, I'm not a Trump supporter, and then they'll tell you what their opinions are. But first, they'll say, I'm not a Trump supporter, and it's happening, too, with some of the Bernie or Buzz people. I didn't support Bernie, but 
Right. Everybody loves to feign objectivity when the yeah. time is right. It's <laughs> and it sometimes it's so much more transparent than they'll ever be able to understand. And it's mm-hmm. it's a show. For sure. Well, so, I was never really just sorry. Right. Exactly. No, no, go ahead. Make your joke, man. No, I was just gonna <laughs> be an asshole. It's fine, be an asshole. It's all good. <laughs> now nah, the moment's ruined. Can't yeah, no, I'm late. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> anyways real quick just to jump in rarely sure. wrong says actually we disagree on the minimum wage question if you artificially boost the wage without simultaneously eliminating section 8 and other housing subsidies the only result will be more dollars going to the landlords so I think that that is uh, partially correct um, I think that if you don't if you don't address why housing costs are going up then ultimately more wages are going to wind up LOL, a feigned objectivity. <laughs> Fair enough. I do have a skin in this game. Uh, but what you aren't expecting me to say is that what I do favor is some kind of uh, uh, look, uh, vacancy tax where you have yep. investors and speculators that have these properties that are sitting there vacant. So you have almost a million properties in the United States that are just empty, that are sitting there. And one of the reasons that that works is because the way that you know property values and just real estate in general works as far as you know your ROI, it often pencils out for these investors to build these nice homes, let them sit vacant. And uh, I actually just did a transaction last year where we bought a house on the ocean front that has been sitting vacant uh, for, well, since 2007. Jesus. So, for 13 years. New construction, guy built it, just let it sit there. So there's a lot of money to be made in high-end real estate where you can just spend a ton of money yep. to build stuff and if you don't get your price you just let it sit there until it pencils out because over time you have appreciation you make a lot of money so you wind up with tons of homeless people or people who are paying high rents and you have this huge surplus of inventory that's actually just being held by people that already have housing so we've actually got a ton of housing in this country and a ton of homeless people and it's because our structure is wrong the priorities are wrong so an easy way to fix that would just be to have a brutally crushing vacancy or uh, yeah vacancy tax uh where you know people no longer can pencil that out for it to make sense or or you have these incredibly expensive investment properties that are just sitting there while you have all these homeless people or at the very least don't let people write it off like that their state and local taxes off on their llc I don't think we're talking about properties that would otherwise go to the homeless, though. It's not. No, I don't they, think they wouldn't. Fixed. But it would. It would. It would lower the overall price of housing down by opening it up on the market, allowing other people to afford housing, because you would open yeah, up the market. So. So we're talking like what middle, high middle class. But if you let the if you let the middle class and upper middle class get into these homes, that frees up their current housing stock for people that are lower down. It's kind of a hate to say it, but it's kind of a trickle down of it. Well, it's not true. I just down. think it sounds more intuitive than it really is. I mean, we, we should build housing for homeless people, but taxing like some great big no, mansion, I, I, a whole bunch of mansions, or even Mick mansions, you want to go down the income no, no, ladder. No, it's hard. not just that. It's That's like, not going to okay. open it up. That's not going to. It doesn't address the problem is all I'm saying. It's not, it's not just those kind of properties, though. Like, properties in cities where there is growth say empty, too. But I don't want to get into this whole thing. <laughs> So, True, this is a buster uh, conversation. <laughs> Welcome to yeah. Crowdsource Politics, everybody, where we talk about yeah, everything. Segway Bernie into this somehow. <laughs> yeah, I'm not saying homeless people are going to be able to afford luxury condos if you change a bit of the, the, the tax structure. I'm saying if you change the entire incentivization system where the people who build, buy, and invest do so in different patterns, then you can create structures where people aren't pursuing basically non productive or the types of investing and speculation that only benefit the absolutely wealthy. Like you could change it to incentivize that and to give tax breaks and other benefits to people who are either doing low income housing or otherwise not inclined to just build these luxury condos, let them sit vacant. Like right now the whole system is structured for people who do that sort of thing to make a ton of money. And if there are homeless people, there's no penalties. Nobody really suffers other than the homeless people. And that's just because of how the, the game is structured. It's not hard to change yep. how the taxes work and how the, you know, all of that works before you get a, and lending. I mean, there's different types of lending we could do that, you know. For sure. Give government. I think we could directly help the homeless people. I just think this is 
not going to do it. I'm not saying that you're saying they're going to get into the luxury condos. I'm just saying you're pointing those out and then saying, you know, we should do something about that to alleviate the homelessness problem. I think we should just actually have public housing for them. Like we should actually tax them that way, tax rich people that way if you want to, because we have a progressive system. Right, right. But I just, I just think like trying well, to manipulate I, the property markets into coming down in like a high, uh, a high demand area is not going to work. Oh, I'm just gonna, that I, I think we should. That's like the, you know, you do that and it's fixed. Right. Well, well let's, let's bring this back to Bernie. This sounds inconsequential. <laughs> Uh, and, um, do we, so what can we do, um, as people that want to see Trump, uh, lose the next election, what can we do to convince as many of these people as possible to vote for Biden? What should we be focusing on? What should we be appealing to that sort of thing? Sorry, say that again. I was reading something. It's all good. Same thing happens to me. So what's, uh, what do you think we should be appealing to or making our arguments for in order to get as many people as possible to vote for Biden? I mean, the arguments are already out there. I think it's just mainly you know what your views are. You see the choices. One obviously is closer in proximity to what you believe than the other. Make a choice, you know, just don't take a moral stand when it comes to something like this. Is can't there be any all or nothing? It's not how we work. This country has yeah. never worked all or nothing. You, it's incremental. <laughs> incremental change works. Revolutions do not work. They just dragon. Don't. It's not our system. Dragon sword. Can we said? Can we gently link their obsession with Bernie to Biden? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. But good thinking. Biden needs to just start rambling incoherently about corporations, and you'll get those people. <laughs> I think one of the things that we could possibly do um, is focus more on the concessions that the Biden the concessions the Biden camp has already made, and I put them in quotes because they're not really concessions; they're just kind of where the party is now. But he's like talking about it. If we um, kind of focus on those kind of things, I think we could uh, could really see some some uh, head uh, head headway. Yeah, get some headway into that that conversation huh. you know. dragon sword says i get the probably not but blunt force trauma doesn't work either <laughs> revolution does not work don't say that in a u.s history class uh, i was it, absent that month tell it to marie antoinette <laughs> yeah right well, the, the one thing, though, is that I, I think a lot of people um, don't realize how bloody revolutions really are. They, they're they like, it's going to be a political revolution. And I'm like, um, that means Democratic people, revolution. That means people die. Right. right? Well, I, the vulnerable I get might targeted. Happen, actually. I mean, I don't think they're being that literal as someone who I don't know, man. constantly the one who takes things too literally sometimes. I, I really don't think they mean I mean. There's a, a vein in the Bernie's or bus sure. group that's like straight up tankies. I'm sure they mean it, oh, but yeah. I don't think no, that's tankies. really the norm. If you're a tank, yeah, you tankies, can die. I mean, they don't even know what they want. They just want some huge battle, some sort of glory, whatever they see in those old, like, I don't know. I'm just going to make sure up now. For, for people sometimes. that don't know what a tanky is, it is a person that takes communism and Stalinism very seriously. And they call themselves tankies because of the uh, Soviet army's tank division. You know, a lot of tankies don't really like the name tanky, so it's more of, of course a not. insult. <laughs> well, yes, it is very much an insult, but it's one that works. Kind of like calling a, a, a turf a turf. Um, sorry, you think it's a slur? You you can get bent. That's what you are. So, but on that note, like... I prefer Stalinist. <laughs> Please. Have you heard about our beaches being closed out here? And of course, because I, you know, follow social media with all uh, our what used to be a strong GOP stronghold and is now um, a tiny sea of purple or a dot of purple in a sea of blue. But there are people who are fired up about the beaches being closed, and they're like, "We should storm the beach. We should start looking at some Second Amendment solutions." And I'm like, "Okay, so." I don't know if you think that there's any like defensible positions on the beach where you could go out there and like hold it 
from the cops or whatever, but like what, what motivates people to say such stupid things? And, you know, you, they kind of invoke this revolutionary, like George Washington wouldn't have put up with this bull crap kind of a thing. And it's just like LARPing. Like it's this ridiculous, <laughs> uh, like, you know, you know, Patriot cosplay where they just, you know, talk about this. There's no such thing as like a second amendment solution per se. I mean, in theory, Okay, I mean, there, there's the idea of guns being the counterweight against a you know rogue government and da da da. Got it. With and without going down that route, that's not like voting is a solution or like a public protest is a solution. Like that's, that's gonna hurt. You know, when you talk about like a Second Amendment solution, you're talking about like burning the country down and starting over. Like you there's really want to protect right. beaches been closed for like two weeks. Like really, like it's that bad. Like things have gotten that bad where it was like, no, nope, sorry. We just got to put a torch to everything. Start over. Can't have the beach closed. Like, <laughs> I just, ah, I don't. I, I think just, Second Amendment solution heavily implies like using guns. Like, there's really, it's hard to really get around that. Like, you right. can't be talking politics about we need the Second Amendment solution for this one. It's like, you know, there's no figurative meaning there. Like, it's hard to take that any way but literal. Start the well, boogaloo. Then- Let's go. You have these guys down at the the Lansing, uh, Michigan courthouse who are showing up in their, you know, Mujahideen, you know, Patriot. You know, <laughs> and, you know, that's a, patriotic. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Right. Yeah. And that's a kind of a, a form of that where it's it's quote unquote nonviolent. But when you show up with, you know, 200 dudes with, you know, long guns, that's actually not peaceful per se. That's intimidation. I mean, that's, yep. you know, a, a company full of armed troops that have showed up to express their displeasure. There is an implied threat behind that. So they're kind of riding this line where you're saying, hey, if we don't get what we want, you know, there could be trouble. When you've got that many armed people, it's not just a, a protest or political thing. There's also like a, a life and death, like military threat behind it. But it's fake. Like it's, it's actually not real because there is no Second Amendment solution per se. And again, I say this is a bit of a gun nut. But that's not how the world works. Like, you, that's the kind of thing where if you hit that button, you know, that changes the course of history and potentially you lose. Like, George Washington and the rest of the founders and all them, if they had lost, they all would have died. They would have been hung as traitors and that would have been it. Like, there, there would have been no, like, you know, okay, well, fine, we lost this round. So the people that talk like that, it's this weird, like, section of like american political mythology where we imagine that like guns fix problems then they don't really fix political problems like it's not how it works so mm. it's just a weird like uh, i don't know this tribal like totem that we invoke just to make ourselves brave right. but incredibly stupid because you know god forbid if any of these protests turn violent and you get these you know uh, 100 200 guys who are heavily armed shooting at like state police and militia and what that turns into like you know, that's completely idiotic. It's just, it's, it's a mistake to even go down that route. So I don't know. Yeah. I just wanted to write on that for a minute. I mean, that's fair. You, it's right outside your window. So yeah. that's all. Had enough of that shit in Baghdad. I don't need to hear it. <laughs> I mean, I think you can protest with guns on you. It's hard not to think that other people aren't going to take it in any other way than like an implied threat. I mean, I guess it's always an implied threat, but so would anything. But at the same time, I think, uh, like, I think if the issue is actually the Second Amendment, that's kind of fine. This is obviously not a Second Amendment issue, so right. I could see why you know we wouldn't see it as that. Right. But I think there are times where it's like it's not intended to be a a threat. I mean, people could take it that way, but people feel threatened by things that they probably shouldn't all the time because most guns aren't used to kill people despite what people think. No, no, right. I'm, I'm very specifically is like having a political protest where you have these guys show up in like face masks and long guns. Yeah, that's definitely, especially when it's like, this has nothing to do with guns. This is like the beach. Right. It's literally sure. where the beach. People are upset like, that the beach. What are these people We're doing? With Lansing, Michigan, where you've got like- I need my haircut. Like, like if I can't get a haircut, then I'm going to show up at the state capitol with my gun and I'm going to you know march and yell. Like, that ain't got nothing to do about guns, man. Yeah, do, yeah, it's really um, just a bad look. It's stupid. It's ignorant. <laughs> Legend has it there are more than two amendments. This is only a myth. There's, there's <laughs> proof of this. 
do we have any questions from the audience about the topic? Do we want to have, do you want to hear our thoughts or opinions, everybody? Um, I know this is going to take about 10 seconds or so to propagate, so I'll wait. People go ahead. Uh, anybody or Nikki, um, do you think there's anything that we could do to convince um, people to vote for Biden? Do you think there's anything we should in particularly focus on? I think all we can do is and this is something I have to keep reminding myself of. Um, I'll speak for myself personally. I think I um, need to back down my Aggie, not be quite so much of a bitch and make them feel bad, <laughs> shame them. Um, I think we, all we can do is just continue to tell them this is what Biden's policies are. This is where Bernie stands. This is where Biden stands. Can we meet in the middle? What is it that you would like to see happen? Just dialogue for the ones that will dialogue. But the ones that start with buzzwords immediately, neo-lib, establishment Democrat, just lib parts even come out of their mouth sometimes. So yeah. you know, it has to start at some point. And if we can reach common ground, that's fine. But there's going to come a point where we're just where I am going to say, I'm done. I, if you're not going to do it, you're not going to do it. I'm done. I have other places to put my energy. For sure. Thank you, Razor, for uh, for joining us. Hey, what's up, Razor? To me, it's the akin to trying to convert a Trump fan. Exactly. Well, we know who you are, uh, Jason. Oh, uh, Razor, Jason. Thanks, thanks for joining us. Cool. Yeah, I, I. If you are coming to us from our Facebook group or the Facebook page, I do apologize. Uh, we, I tried streaming it in both places at the same time, and it was just not working whatsoever. Uh, go ahead, Art. All right, so I want to ask you guys a question now. So we're talking about getting Bernie fans over and con and concessions. So when we talk about real concrete concessions, let's talk about Joe Biden, 157 years old. He's probably going to be <laughs> one. So the biggest concession that Joe can make, and Joe's even said this, he's like, I'm really just here to open things up for like the Pete Buttigieg's of the world. Like, right. He He's pulling not... Nancy Pelosi. Wait, uh, Biden is opening it up for the Pete Buttigieg of the world? So yeah, he says, he's kind of yeah. leading it like a mentor. And all of these great people that ran will be right are right behind him, as it were. Right, Art? Yes. Or, and and yeah. he very specifically said that, you know, he sees himself as, as a transitional figure between kind of the present and then the Pete Buttigieg's of the world. And that was the example he used. But, you know, the implication is that all these people that, you know, couldn't beat him in the primary are going to be the future of the party. Right. So that was a, that was a little bit of a hidden dig there in case nobody got it. <laughs> so for the specific need to placate the far left, is that the way to do it? Do you bring on some kind of far left VP? And if so, who is it going to be, even though we all know it's actually going to be Kamala Harris? <laughs> I don't know. I don't think we can do that. I think though, it's going to be Stacey Abrams. That I she, hope not. She gets such a reaction from people. Uh, oh, you know, that's, that's actually Virginia, interesting. I hear nothing but good things about her, and I need to hear some criticisms. One of you, either you or Art, said to me at some point in the last month or so that the person he chooses as VP has to be ready and capable and experienced enough to step into the president's spot at a moment's notice. That's not Stacey Abrams. And oh, I agree. Also, I don't think if he chooses a far left or even a left left as opposed to a center left VP pick, I think that's going to turn off the moderate, I mean, I'm sorry, not the moderates, the disaffected Republicans and the Republican leaning independents. And I think we're going to pull a lot of those people. So the only yeah, real in politics is uh, Bernie Sanders. And like Tashimoto was just saying, Bernie's not even really controversial anywhere outside the U.S. Yeah. And he's only like mildly controversial in the U.S. So I don't really even know who's like this far left person. Like AOC is too young. Um, any of the, the squad, they're all too young. Like of the people who are actually eligible, you know, Liz Warren's probably the furthest left, but. They'd be 150 years old together. They, yeah. they would be, wow, nearly as old as the Republic. So Biden's well, the most progressive <laughs> one on that stage. So, I mean, he shouldn't go left. He it's is. already so far left. Mm-hmm. Agreed. 
Wait, is a is yeah, AOC I'm too young? He's not eligible. Who? Oh, uh, Tashimoto said AOC 2020, and I'm saying uh, she's actually oh, she's not eligible. She's not legally eligible yet. Oh, uh, the vice president has the same age requirement as the president. Correct. Oh, okay. Yeah, I figured it was. Sounds I just right. can't remember. But I think they do putting up. Uh, it's what you were talking about the uh, the the fact that Bernie Sanders isn't controversial anywhere else. It, honestly, it's fifty years of red scare. <laughs> That's also, what it boils I don't down think to. It's really that scary to anybody in America either. I think it had to do with the fact that we are all so fucking tired, outrage, fatigue, three and a half years of absolute mm, just nonsense, and. I think that people, voters, saw Bernie as a angry and angry, revolutionary kind of guy. He was angry. I mean, he shook his finger all the time. He was angry all the time, and mm-hmm. I think that caused people to move toward Biden because we don't want that anymore. We're ready to just maybe take a deep breath and relax and not be afraid somebody's going to blow us up, like the guy in the White House does. Not yeah, I think that's definitely part of it, at least for people that are over the age of 35. There is definitely a demographic, age demographic difference between tolerance for fuckery, I Bewildering guess. Bewildering, it sells more than anger, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I'm just making fun of Biden. Sorry. <laughs> it's all right. I do think that's one of the things that we shouldn't be playing into, though, is the whole any any of the that's memes. That's why I stopped. <laughs> no, I, I it's just it's an important point to it's an important thing to point out. I was watching Biden um, and Hillary Clinton talk where Hillary endorsed him the other day, and everybody's like, "Oh my God, if he picks Hillary, it's over." Oh, Twenty eight oh, years of Trump, like it's done for Democrats, and and it was just an endorsement. And they're talking about like when I was a girl, I lived in this street that you lived on, and like we are twenty years apart, but we're from the same kind of rough and tumble like my like, guy right, all right what pause. i love when she gets a southern what? droll <laughs> yeah right oh but, man she's um, the best but he was he was going he was when during the entire thing i was watching vosh vosh is a it's a great uh youtuber by the way if you're at all left liberal you probably find him entertaining but biden was doing this thing where he was like looking down like this and he was just like and Vash is like, wake up, Sleepy Joe, wake up. And then he would like lift his head up. He's like, see, you just, I did it. Single-handedly saved America. And I'm like, yeah, that's funny, but you shouldn't be making those jokes because it plays into the whole like, Sleepy Joe. Joe's yeah. got dementia. And dementia. dementia. Yeah. Like, yeah, right. And, Should have voted for uh, Bernie. <laughs> that's what they'll say. There you go. But like, I don't know. Um I don't think Joe has dementia. I think he's just always been a, a uh, has an issue with his words, and it's just he's older, so he doesn't correct them as quickly as he used to. So. Oh, in that debate between him and Sanders, Sanders called uh, what did he call? He called COVID nineteen Ebola like three times, or H one N one, or something. It was not he did not use the term COVID nineteen? Yeah. Or, novel coronavirus he called it by another disease's name and he did it three times another virus's name he did it three times and then he caught himself and said whoa i didn't mean that i meant covid yeah yeah i mean everybody misspeaks every once in a while joe's just got a, a panache for it oh he does <laughs> he's got a deep repertoire of uh <laughs> we call we call him gas when we want to be euphemistic <laughs> Remember Ford falling down the steps coming off of Air Force One? I mean, didn't he yeah. also like choke on a pretzel too? Yes, he did. Bush did. Bush choked on a pretzel. His uh, dogs licked his face for the fool salt. Fool me once. <laughs> fool me once. Oh my. But those those are definitely things I think we shouldn't be bringing attention to. The creepy Joe memes, anything like that. Like, it is what it is. I'm not going to bring it up. Somebody else brings it up. I fine. I mean, I'll bring it up. It is. Comedy. It's funny. It is funny, but at Comedy the same cool. time, it if there's if people laugh, they'll believe it. So, uh, Art, you had something you want to break in with? Yeah, just two things real quick. One is that Tashimoto points out that uh, dementia didn't stop Reagan, and so back in the day, <sighs> and this is again before social media, but you know, Reagan was the first really like media savvy president. Like you had other guys that kind of understood it and dealt with it, but you know, he was actually like president of the Screen Actors Guild you know, a Hollywood actor, Mm -hmm. like he actually really got it. And he was very, very good with his image and the kind of, you know, upbeat, charismatic, like just very 
you know, on the ball kind of a you know all around American good guy leader. And as he got older, like especially into his second term, he really lost his step, and they really tightly controlled his image. But I mean, shortly after leaving the White House, like that dude was in a nursing home, like he was barely functional. Bush and, Senior was doing a lot of the management for that uh, yeah. administration towards the end. For Absolutely. sure. Absolutely. Well, and to even take a uh, uh, oops, hold on, take a step back. Um, if you go back to like Woodrow Wilson, so like, you know, at one point he had a stroke while he was in office, which they basically covered up and they hid from Congress. And, Jesus. you know, Congress started to sort of figure it out. But his wife, Edith Wilson, was basically running the country for like the last two years of office. And, you know, the White House was not letting people in. And there was, you know, periods of weeks where no one saw the president but her. She'd just go out and talk to him and come out and say, so this is what he says we should do. That wouldn't fly these days. But no. you know things are you know and things have changed. That's when they you know worked on uh, uh, you know uh, let's say a different type of you know public persona. Whereas now it's also media intense and especially social media intense. It's insane that you can have somebody like Trump, who's clearly not mentally well, make fun of Biden, who's also lost his step. But that's kind of where we're at now, where yeah. the whole type of mental acuity it's a very front and center thing where your personality and your dynamic matters a lot. But what's really inversely funny about all that is that our system is based off of personnel as policy and you have the president up top, but the president doesn't really run things day to day. You make certain large decisions, but most of that decision is who you put to run this giant bureaucracy underneath you. So really any given administration is not the president up there, just like at the big desk, signing paperwork and making stuff happen. You're more of like a almost a not quite a figurehead, but you're a ringleader for a giant circus. Right. Under so having Biden in play doesn't mean that Biden and Biden's personal mental acuity matters per se. He just needs to put the right people in the right positions, people who are qualified, that are competent, that believe in crazy things like global warming or climate change. And when you have the right kind of people in the right positions, that's really what the presidential job is about. It's about having the architecture of government that is structured in a way that you get good results and you mm. with people like trump or not really even trump because he's not ideological but like the current gop small government like government's the root of all problems if you don't believe in government government can't fix anything so when you get a thing like covid19 roll in mm -hmm. you can't deal with it because you don't have people in place that are the best and brightest or even believe that they're anything but in the way like literally the people that Trump has working for them don't like government and they're in the government. So they you know, almost like on an ontological level, they can't fix it because they don't even believe that they should be there to fix it in the first place. So for sure, that's my issue with the whole idea of like, Oh, slow Joe, slow Biden, who cares? Like as long as Biden takes people that are qualified and puts them in the right positions to run these big agencies and the people below them enforce standards and make sure that good results are generated. That's what the government is. It's not some dude sitting in the Oval Office just like, you know, shooting from the hip, making everything happen. That's that's just not how it works. That's bring, how it works now. It's not how it's supposed to work. Though. Bring, uh, bring, bring me a good bureaucracy, like, for serious. I mean, cabinet members have varying roles within administrations. Like, some State Departments are super hands-on, like, like Hillary Clinton during Obama, and others oh, are yeah. just, like, not at all. Kind of like Rex Tillerson, I guess, at a certain point. Um, well, I mean, Rex stopped being so, listened to since he was getting contradicted. So, yeah, administration. That's what the word means. That's yeah. what the president is. He's an so as long as Biden picks right people thing. and steps back and lets them do their thing, that's I'd add that caveat, right. and I'd right. be really yeah, comfortable. I, think he would. I don't want him to jump in and be like, "Listen here, Blackjack." <laughs> Listen here, you your dog face pony shoulder. <laughs> oh God, dog face, li lying dog face. The lion dog, yeah. Seventeenth oh, century uh, slang words. <laughs> uh, I think we did have a, a great comment about the vice president's uh, pick being very important. So from from us here, who do we, who would would be our preferred? or your preferred um, VP pick out of everybody that's known um, so far. Tulsi. <laughs> okay. So old. And I like Kamala Harris. In the Senate. Beto. 
I I, th- I, th- I think Kamala makes a uh, a logic is a logical choice. Um, I think Duckworth would be a good choice as well. Oh, I've heard her name and being floated. That, Gretchen Whitmer is that the um, what state is she in? Gretchen Whitmer, she, which she's a, I, I couldn't tell you a governor. I think she'd be very good too. I just don't think Stacey Abrams has the experience. I just don't. And, I think and that's fair. Yeah. A lot of Republicans. I've just always seen people like they get so defensive. Like it's like this weird, almost like thing about her. Well, so I just thought it was like going to be a big pick for them, but it, I'm actually it, it, glad to hear someone saying no. Well, it, it's one of those things where she, she does check a lot of boxes. Um, and I don't mean just ide- ideologically, I mean, or ID poll, I mean like ideologically as well. Um, but at the same time, I think a lot of the whole, she piss off the Republicans thing. I think it's because she's a black woman, <laughs> just straight up. Like we have, we have a, per- a particular person in our group that mentions it all the time of how all she's bitter. Time. And, uh, and that's yeah. proof it's cause she's black. Uh, the his language behind well this particular person brought up the fact that she was mistaken as the help when she went to a governor's function and she couldn't she hasn't gotten over it yet so she made it her life's mission in order to become the governor of north carolina so she could stick it to everybody else oh my god so i am pretty sure that means it's because she's black mm-hmm. <laughs> at least for this particular person that happened to madeline albright too just so you know she showed up at this european conference and walked in and they thought that she was the cleaning lady Oh my god. Wow. <laughs> Have white men ever been mistaken like that or no? Nah. No. Yeah, I, I don't think so ever. Yeah, I don't think so either. <laughs> I'm kidding, guys. <laughs> yeah, I'm like not. the tail. I'm not. We're on Twitch, man. <laughs> I'm don't not clip kidding that. at all. Don't clip it. <laughs> it's gonna be the highlight. <laughs> I'm yeah, gonna... the is that she didn't win anything and you know. When you get down to it, you're looking for somebody that can kind of cross the finish line. And like when she speaks, like she actually isn't a great command of the issue. She's a great natural politician. And the fact that somebody who didn't win has still managed to keep herself this high in the public discourse is kind of amazing. It is a test yeah. of a good politician she is. But it's kind of like the same. It's kind of the same thing with Beto. Like. You can only per- parlay a defeat so far before you, you need to actually translate that into a win. Otherwise, you're just somebody that's kind of good at working the media, but you're not right. actually good at doing that into results. Beto so, has yeah. a really – Beto can't be picked because Beto has a penis. Remember, he's using a woman. <laughs> yeah. Um, he – I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> oh, yes, uh, we're coming for your guns. Okay, so uh, we actually have a, a question from Stan VB. Um, let's see. After the next four-year term, do we think the U.S. would benefit of having major third party being introduced into the U.S. system, a party that would be positional between the current Democratic Republican Party most likely? Uh, no, I'm going to go ahead and say no, and that's only because our voting system sucks and is not – uh, suited for third party. Um, uh, let me caveat this. So a, a third party can rise from the ashes of a current party or a combination of two of the ter- of the of the current party or a combination of current parties. Um, but our voting system itself, Duvugger's Law, where you have a first past the post winner take all election system, n- necessitates people to gravitate towards two two big parties where they have the most overlap ideologically. It's just the way, it's just the way all these systems work. Go ahead. Um, Arlen. Go ahead. No, nah, never mind. Cause uh, there's a lot of charts and everything I'd have to pull up. I don't think we got time for that. Do we think that um, with this, I think that the Republican party is split. I don't think Trump represents like my grandfather being a Republican. I agree. There's a lot of people who they won't admit it. They won't talk about it because that's how party politics works. Yeah. But the second Trump is gone, the second he's no longer their standard bearer, they're going to distance themselves from it. They're going to pretend like like but earlier I said they're just going to be they're going to feign uh, objectivity. Yeah. Like, well, I was really hard on that guy, you know. Meanwhile, they're probably yeah. saying, "Ha ha, libs, you're mad." Right, Art. You had a point you wanted to make. Yeah. So uh, back in the day, Ross Perot, um, he was fiddling with the thing called the Reform Party. Eventually, just ran as independent. He got 19 percent of the vote. In a presidential election, nine impressive of the American electorate voted for this guy. He got 
Zero. Zero. Zero electoral college votes. Nothing. Nada. So, and he didn't even really get close. So the way that our system is structured, where you have two parties that run 50 different races in 50 different states, they have, over the last 200 years, completely, and I don't like to use the word rigged because of what it implies, but let's say structured it so that you really can't run effectively as a third party. It right. is a, a low, it's a closed system where only those two parties are really competitive and anybody else has a staggering disadvantage. So you really can't do a third party effectively in the United States. Your best hope is to infiltrate one of the parties and take it over. And that's traditionally what's happened and you know is currently happening now. For instance, with the uh, GOP, you know, it used to be kind of a, uh, let's call it a corporate party with a bit of a white nationalist problem. And now it's a white nationalist problem with a bit of right. a corporate problem. Right. So, you know, that's kind of how it works is that you have these like interests that are within an existing structure. And if you get popular enough and strong enough, you take it over and you become the new establishment. And that works. Third parties don't work. Yeah. The, uh, the money in politics just good for spoilers. Rarely wrong ask which will happen first. Major third party runoff election between top two for president, forcing winner to have 50% plus one, or three proportionate elector electors in the same state. I think we already have proportionate electors in the same state. Um, Maine does a similar, th a similar thing, right? Handful, I want to say yeah. it's Maine. Yeah. There's a couple of states that all already do some sort of proportional system. Um, the the cool thing about a proportional system is that it doesn't actually take a constitutional amendment to uh, to get through. It does take some on the state level, but that's easier to do because some states have – a lot of states have referendums for those sort of things. There's also the state uh, pact to give all their electors to the um, the winner of the national party vote or popular vote. And I want to say there's uh, 13 or 14 states currently signed on to that pact. Once they reach 50% uh, plus one of the total, popul uh, total number of electors, then it's a moot point because they determine the outcome of the election. Um, I think there's needing to be another 50 or so electors for that. So, You know what? I just forgot. There's an even better example of um, third parties in the U.S. Uh, when Roosevelt, not... Oh, yeah. yeah yeah teddy he had the the bull moose party which he was a progressive and he was one of the first american politicians to really embrace yep. that he got kind of frustrated with the state of things so when he ran um he did better than the loser like woodrow wilson won he had like 40 percent yeah and roosevelt got uh, let's call it like 27 percent and right. then whoever the other guy was got like 20%. i think it was, like, it was taft really, taft yes taft. he actually beat the guy from the major party who lost like you think about that like imagine we had democrats republicans and like the green party imagine the green party you know came in second place and still lost and then still collapsed after that like they even coming in second in a presidential election which is would be almost impossible right now you still don't get anywhere like unless you're able to subvert one of the parties like the last time it actually worked was the Whig party yep. uh prior Civil War. And the only reason that worked is that they basically forced, or I should say the Republican Party was created, and most of the major players simply just left the Whig yep. Party and the Republican Party. So they didn't quite subvert it so much as just, you know, create a new structure and then poach everyone from it and just, you know, <laughs> just blew yeah, off it, the old party. It requires the people that are currently within the major two parties to break away from them and form it, form a new one themselves. Yeah, like with right now, you'd need, you know, if you wanted to create, let's say, like a new, you know, Democratic Party, because you couldn't stand the DNC, for that to even possibly work, you'd need to pull over like Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, like all of the, you know, the big power players from the, the Democratic Party into this new party for it to even possibly work. And you need and, to get all of them. Yeah, and regional parties could work. It just wouldn't work on a presidential level. So you could have, I, this is one of the things. Don't want to get super into it, but this is one of the things why I don't take any of the third parties very seriously is because they're not doing the things required to actually be a third party so much. Like, there's no reason why um, a coalition from the libertarians can't have at least one person in Congress. 
given how libertarian a lot of the Southwest is, but they don't put any of the resources into those. They do presidential elections every four years. And outside of like Indiana and New Hampshire and a couple of other places where they have city council members, they don't do anything. And it's the same thing with the Green Party. Green Party's got one person in Washington. And that's not like it. Yeah. Go ahead, Art. There's a reason for that. And that is that the, like libertarian and in the U.S. that means basically right libertarian doesn't work. Yeah. So you can't get people who are completely antisocial and obsessed with their own point of view and rights to ever work together on anything because it fundamentally does not work. They don't believe in government. They don't believe that coming together collectively serves any purpose. So at most they get together and kind of bitch about stuff. But for that to translate into any kind of like governing philosophy, they're against governing philosophies. So it's not going to work. You kind of have this libertarian party that's almost just like this angry, grumpy reaction to the other two parties, but it's not itself a coherent philosophy as far as if they were in power, how would they run things? At most, they would just dismantle things, which in a sense would be running things, but it doesn't, they can't even agree enough to do that. Yep. Well, um, is there any any last thoughts? We've been uh, broadcasting for about an hour and 40 minutes or so. Uh, James Clapp asked, who is this freedom-hating bald guy? <laughs> we do. I do need to get the names on here. I, I forgot to do that, but everybody Thank knows you. it's art. Everybody <laughs> knows it's art. That's Arthur White. Right. Freedom-hater extraordinaire. <laughs> Talking about freedom. Better not be saying anything bad about my freedom. Uh, do we have oh, any French more fries and it's a fight? Oh man, uh, that that's, <laughs> I don't know if anybody was present for my little talk about that, but yeah. So actually, um, in two thousand five or six, I actually almost got kicked out of a restaurant for requ- refusing to call them freedom fries. <laughs> so that that actually happened. You're such a rebel. What a I was like, I was like 15 or something at a time. I was just like, no. And the guy's like, you better say it. I'm like, no. And he just like walked away. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Do you think you Biden's think- go ahead, Art, you go ahead and read it. Do you think Biden's VP pick will cause him to sink or swim? Swim. Hmm. Literally. I will mean, he's Allen the choice. Oh my God. Uh, no. God, I hope not. Oh I mean, isn't God. that kind of what Clinton did a little bit? I don't know. There uh. Tim Kaine had some popularity. Oh, no, Tim Kaine was good pure vanilla. vanilla. Yeah, he was still super Gosh, vanilla. Jinx. <laughs> <laughs> which one? Which one? Oh, you bought? You got? You owe Mateo Coke, Nikki. <laughs> okay, I'll take care of that shortly. This no episode brought to you by you. Coca-Cola. Enjoy Coca-Cola. <laughs> it's brought to you by Coca-Cola and Bullet Bourbon. Nice. <laughs> Do you God, I hope this? not. I'll jump in whenever you're ready. I have strong feelings on Sarah Palin. Okay. I, I don't. I don't see him Sarah Palin it. To be honest. Uh, Look at the field. We already know the people he's choosing from. None of those are Sarah Palin. I mean, oh, it is. It is very possible he comes out of left field and picks somebody that no one's ever heard of. God. But I don't. I don't see it simply because he's already said I'm a one-term president, and the fact that he said that is. I'm not. Bring, I didn't bring it up. I didn't say it. I didn't say it. Nope. Okay, didn't say it. I mean, it's kind of. <laughs> didn't smart. say it. Sh- 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 <laughs> <laughs> All we know for sure is that the person's not going to have a penis. Other than that, we don't really know anything about who they're going to be. I guess there's a big field, and I hope he doesn't pick somebody who says, "I can see a Russia from my house." I, I, as long as we don't go that way, I think he's going to swim. I don't all think right. anyone's ever going to make that type of mistake again. That yeah. was that was just not doing what? any vetting at all. I mean, they picked Trump, so. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, you wanted, I think Trump just had a plurality. I don't think he was a majority. He wasn't. That's he didn't true. win the majority. He just won a plurality. That's it. Another reason why the Democratic the electorate. Another reason why the Democratic primary process is superior to the Republican one. But Art, you had strong and feelings on Sarah and Palin. Oh yes. <laughs> She wanted a voice. Real quick on Joe Biden. Joe Biden is going to pick somebody, and that somebody is Kamala Harris. But 
I was that girl, Joe. <laughs> right. You know, having that bit of dramatic tension, I think, you know, you get these former rivals that come together for the good of the party. It's very like Avengers. You know, everyone kind of has their, their beefs. You know, we're not a team. We're a time bomb. You know, they'll be able to kind of put <laughs> together, to, you know, and save the day against Loki. But what's different here is that Biden is himself the old credible guy. So he can actually, I think, afford a little bit of zing. I mean, he could get a Tim Kaine. He gets somebody boring. But really, anybody he picks who's not a white man that is old enough to remember when, like, swing music was hot on the radio. I live in Austin. It's still hot. Just saying. Had to make a joke. Go on, go on, go on. on. uh, And I I agree with you. Um, (laughs) But literally anything he does, it's even a little bit edgy. Like if he picks any woman of any kind, odds are he's going to die of natural causes by December. So it doesn't matter. (laughs) (laughs) That's why it can't be Stacey Abrams. That's exactly why. Right. Um, So I think with that, He's in a position where he doesn't really have to do very much at all, but pick somebody, and literally anybody. He could pick, um, what's her name with the stapler? Uh, stapler? I have no idea what you're talking about. It's a joke. It's... No, no, no. With the, that she abuses her staff violently. Oh, and, oh, oh, the Amy, binder. Yeah, Amy, yeah, yeah. Amy, yeah, Amy, Amy Klobuchar. Yeah, oh, Klobuchar. She, so, she, like, threw, anyway. she threw binders at people. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Binders full of women? We've never binders had. Binders full of women. <laughs> yeah. She would be a dramatic change from the past of American history. So, like, anybody he picks that's female is going to be just a shocking change. So he doesn't have to do very much. Now, what's different with McCain is that McCain was losing. McCain was getting blown out. And and not his fault. Nobody wanted that job. George Bush had completely destroyed the GOP. Uh, that was a low point of Iraq where everything had been run into the ground. We were in the midst of the surge. If you remember the surge back then? Good times. I was there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you also had the housing crisis. You had all kinds of problems going on. And everyone was just like this GOP thing. Like it just, <clears throat> they gave Bush a second chance and they realized they shouldn't have. It was just, it was a mistake. And he ran everything into the ground. You get this Barack Obama guy out of nowhere. I mean, he had done some good speeches for the DNC, but he was this new, interesting figure. And All he was black. Was there. Community organizer. Well, and he was yeah, black. State Senate, senator, all that. I mean, he, uh, he was new and different enough that McCain, who really his claim to fame was war in a time that nobody wanted any more war, he was just the wrong guy for the job. Picking Palin was the smartest thing he could have done because the grassroots yeah. he hated him and the moderates were not going to vote for him. It so would he, have been more of a blowout than it was, it to be honest not pick Palin. And even though Palin was a gamble that did not pay off, if she was even moderately literate, like I'm talking bare bones, like if you, like they asked her, hey, what newspapers do you read? She's like, newspapers? <laughs> Didn't she say like all of them because she had all no them, answer? Yeah. She's like, yeah, yeah I know all of them. them. She just got <laughs> blown out. Like if she wasn't a total disaster, even a partial disaster, if she wasn't a total disaster, he at least would have lost a little less. Yeah. As it he was going to lose that election. Nothing was going to change that. The only thing that was going to change was the margin of loss. And Palin gave him a less margin of loss. And I know everybody's like, oh, you know, McCain was going to do great. They picked Palin. Palin ruined it for him. No, no, it's not how it worked. I mean, and again, I was a Republican back then. I remember how <laughs> within Chanting the, the fundamentals of the economy was strong is what did it for him. Old, yeah. real, like, he was the wrong guy. The base hated him. The grassroots hated him. And Palin got everybody fired up and it gave him a fighting chance. As it was, she was a moron and just completely, oh he took a losing hand and turned it into a different type of losing hand. And that's fine. Biden yep. has a different problem where Biden actually has a winning hand. Trump is destroying himself. Like at this point, yep. Biden doesn't have to pick anybody. You can just say, you know, oh, I'm vice president. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe me. I'll also be my vice president. Like he could do stupid stuff at this point it doesn't matter because trump is just hell-bent on destroying himself unelecting so, himself in real time yeah so right at this point it's a way different situation really what it matters to kind of get back to the whole point of our uh you know burning or bust situation 
Joe has already said he's not the future of the party. He's really just kind of a transitional figure to stop the bleeding. He's almost like a tourniquet. He's just going to stop the bleeding of crazy. And he's going to give you know it time for the doctors to stabilize the patient and then get them into surgery. So Biden can't do more than just stop what's going on. He doesn't have any answers. He doesn't really you know, have any new policies that's going to fix what's going on with us. At most, he can stop us from devolving into this weird, like, ethno-fascist, right. you know, creepy white nationalist state. Like, he just, he realizes that that's the wrong direction. He's got enough juice to stop that. That's where he's at. So who he picks for vice president matters way more than it normally does, because this isn't just some, like, oh, I need to get across the finish line. This is really, like, setting the stage for what the future of the party is going to be, because right. he ain't running for the term. I mean, he'll be lucky to make it through yep. first. So... It matters a lot. I think it's going to be Harris because she's also different enough. And just real quick for my reasons for Harris. And aside from, you know, the identity. She's not a white male. <laughs> um, she's got a lot of ties to the Clinton network. And the Clintons were very network based. They cared about the organizations that held power. So you still have Clintonites, even though Clinton hasn't been in power since the 90s. You still have people that identify as Clintonites. Uh, you know, that donor base, that type of stability. It's the establishment, but it's the establishment in an era where you've got these weird like rebels at the gates that want to destroy everything. So somebody that actually can channel the establishment has a lot of sway and power, you know, that makes people feel safe and comfortable. Like people don't really trust what Trump would do if he could dismantle the entire establishment. And they don't necessarily trust Bernie either. Like there's a there's a, a line of thinking that Bernie could do great, but it's also change and change is scary. So especially now, especially now when you've got this other type of change on the other side, like there's a lot of strength and stability. So I think that that, you know, plus that kind of, you know, California being the uh, a base of power for the left and for, you know, the Democratic Party. There's a strong stabilizing argument for somebody like Harris, you know, someone who's a prosecutor who, you know, took down criminals on behalf of the state. A lot of the far left is going to hate a lot of what I just said, but yep. a lot of the center left is going to love it. And I think that that's the argument that Biden is probably going to make is that, hey, I'm not the guy for the future. And Harris is different, but she's not that different. Right. You know, she's a female and ethnic version of what I am. And for right now, for 2020, <laughs> that's probably the change that America is ready for. And they're probably not ready for like this hardcore like socialist uprising where we dismantle communism and do this and that. The stuff that the left would really like to see. But the bulk of America is probably abolish not Abolish ICE. Yeah, abolish ICE, all that. Open the borders. Open the borders. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, again, at some point I'm probably in for open borders. But, you know, I understand that most Americans would not be. We're not quite there yet. So, you know, Biden's probably going to make a very practical choice as far as how much change are we ready for? And by not picking some other white dude like Tim Kaine, who could not have been the worst choice for Hillary. And I get the Virginia argument because Trump was surging Virginia. But um, anyway. It was a good technical move, but it yeah. just it's an old school play and it just it doesn't work today. Play, and that was the problem is that nobody realized that Trump was reinventing the game. And you, you can't fault. 2016 was such a, a shocking upheaval that you can't blame anybody for not seeing it coming. Trump didn't even see it coming. Do you remember him oh. on election night oh. sitting there at the table? Just he was so mad. And no, he said he um, rented a smaller venue that he yeah. told his people rent a small venue because it's going to be embarrassing enough. As dumb as he, he is, he, he knows what he looks like to other people. He's yeah. got a good idea of how shitty he looks. He, he did we, not expect uh, to win. We, and we he should have won. We did have a question in the chat saying, what swing state does Kamala bring in? And I uh, think none, none on the um, uh, the traditional sense, but I wouldn't underestimate the power of another first. Right. Especially with the, um, with the center of, um, not the center of the Democratic Party, but a lot of people saying that a lot of the Democratic activists and, the, and the, the people that go out and try to get people to vote are black women. So I wouldn't underestimate that as a factor for potentially bringing in another state. And I think well, any non-white male is just going to really appeal to Democrats anyway. Right, but I'm saying this particular, this, this in particular case might be uh, more of a win in that regard than, I don't know, and Amy Klobuchar would be. 
Oh, we yeah. Have, we have yeah. to I mean, it up not so even that... because of. And not just because of race, because... but. Yeah, but that's also my bias because I just liked Harris from the start. I, I was actually telling you guys, mark my word, she's <laughs> yeah. going to win the presidency. Uh, if you guys go to the very first episode, I think it was the first episode uh, where Probably we talked about Kamala here, yeah. Harris. <laughs> but we were talking about different Democratic candidates and everybody's like, yep, Kamala's going to win. And I think I was like, I don't know, guys. Uh. <laughs> now, I'm going to give you my number two because even though it's going to be Harris and it bores me, but it's just what it's going to be. My number two would be uh, Cinema from Arizona. Oh, okay. Now, the reason I say that is because um, Arizona is on the verge of being flipped, uh, not just from purple, but like to blue. Like you actually, we've got the you know enough change there where it's you know he B- Biden's leaving by some crazy amount. I think he's up by like eleven in some recent poll. Like he's just running away with it. But you know she has this interesting mix where she's actually fairly. I don't want to say. Conservative is not the right word, but you know, I she's, know what you mean, though. she's not a leftist. She's, you know, actually fairly you know, strict on immigration and a lot of other, uh, you know, let's say centrist positions. And she's gay. So like you actually can mix her. She's bi or something, but like, you know, an LGBT, LGBTQ. Um, Are you talking about the LAPD? <laughs> Anyways. Fairly, right. Yeah, I was uh, mixing my metaphors there. Uh, and then someone who's conventionally attractive, but also very charismatic. Like, unfortunately, a lot of recent female politicians have not been terribly charismatic because to compete True. in this type of environment, you have to take on a lot of like male characteristics that are not super feminine or, or uh, you know, it gives people kind of a rough edge vibe. You know, the Hillary Clinton, the uh, Kamala Harris, all that, they're not terribly um, soft, let's say. Whereas Cinema kind of walks that line where she's actually just charismatic and interesting without being rough around the edges. And that's the kind of thing where it was bound to happen eventually, where you would just get this change where you didn't have to be this weird, combative, male, you know, type of, you know, alpha personality to be effective as a politician. It just wasn't really our, you know, our place because we were still transitioning. We weren't quite right. there yet. So she's kind of that first of somebody who, like, between Biden and her, you know, she's just, you know, she's white, but she's female. So you have that change. She's bisexual, which is more change. But then ideologically, she's pretty moderate. So that plus a state like Arizona, where, like, if the Democrats can pull Arizona away from the GOP and make it a not just a purple, but a blue state, and they're they're closing in on Texas. I mean, the polls yeah, right now. Yeah, they really are. <laughs> I mean, I don't within five percent. Have... Mark my words. Wow. I'm, wow. I'm saying, like, even right now, Biden's going to get a lot closer in Texas than any Democrat has in a very long time, and wow. Texas is on the verge of chipping. Like, if you can pull the Southwest, Texas, Arizona, we already have New Mexico as far as like a blue state. Like, once you pull that out of the red state orbit, that's a game changer. So. Texas flips. D- Texas flips. Republicans will be on the side of saying no more electoral college. Um, I am willing to stay on here longer to talk to you all, uh, but I do have to go up and get to the restroom really quick. So I'll be right back. Go take a leak, man. <laughs> okay. All right, did you see the comments that somebody thought that you might be their boss? Oh, I am your boss. <laughs> <laughs> So they were oh. on their best behavior because they thought Art Black was a stage name for their boss. Sounds definitely a boss's boss. Like, bo- oh, your boss's boss. Or I'm definitely your boss's boss. <laughs> I was literally on my best behavior thinking Art Black. Stage name. Ooh, stage name. My actual stage name is Destiny. Let's see here. Revulsion for Trump will get them up off the couch. Yes. All right. So Death Steel. Revulsion for Trump will it's get me. them off the couch. I think that you talk about how Biden doesn't generate, uh, what's the word? Not not interest or motivation, but uh, excitement. Excitement. Nobody's excited for Biden. They don't have to be. You don't have nope. to be excited for Biden. Trump generates all the excitement that is needed for any one election. It's just the excitement of hate, and that's fine. Brad Glenn Walker. I'm still worried about the flyover areas, as well. You should be. Um, but the polling for most of the swing states um, is looking really good for Biden. I mean, people are looking at the national polls and saying, well, yeah, Biden's winning national polls, but who cares? 
okay, if you actually dig into like Michigan, uh, uh, like Virginia, uh, Arizona, Florida, Texas, places like that, Biden is either winning Pennsylvania, um, he's either out flat out winning, or he's super competitive in states that are, you know, they're purple, but they're more red than purple. So Biden's actually got a really strong handle of where it matters. Oh, no moderator. Now's your time, Mateo. Okay, I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to let Mateo take over because I've just been... <laughs> I've been taking a pretty uh, laid-back stance this whole time. Um, I don't know, man. I got nothing for you. I'm sorry. Would you, would you have a question of how do we think Too COVID might might uh, play out for the uh, the election if the economy reopens and there isn't a large spike? Um, how would that work i think that's a fantasy we're going to have a big spike well 40, 31 states have started to open up sure but if it's if not does that hurt our chances I or rather so. joe's chances people are disgusted uh, with trump they're done i mean it'll definitely give trump some sort of bragging rights in a way whether or not he deserves it it's still gonna mm-hmm. play that way just like uh Bush with the recession, like a lot of that comes from decades before building up, and right, it the optics are just not going to really help, right? Or the optics will help. I mean, well, even if there's not a, a a a spike in deaths, I think a spike in infections where um, there is major rehospitalization would have the same detrimental impact to his chances as if is if the deaths don't follow. We we are humans are good too- at only caring about death though. Yeah, that's true. But we are we are uh, two weeks behind on all our death metrics. So we had the largest uh, increase in deaths, I think, in in Michigan yesterday. Yep. So I think because of that time lag, you're going to see like the economy opens up. They're going to see these deaths going up, and people are like, "Oh, well, we've got to close the economy still." So I, I don't. I'm not sure if it necessarily matters uh, specifically because of that. Do we have any other questions from the audience? So rarely wrong said Texas flips in 2040 and that'll be the end of the electoral college as you know it. So I think Texas is probably going to flip by 2024, not by <laughs> 20, probably not as far as 2040. And it won't be the end of the electoral college, but you're having this demographic shift and I hate reducing politics to demographics, but when you have the kind of politics that we do, which is unfortunately by the design of people who are very unethical, let's say, uh, that is yeah. you know split up on ethnic lines. That's unfortunately the major trend lines you're going to see. When you get to that point where Texas is no longer, you know, quote unquote, white enough to just be a red state, it's going to change our politics, and it always does. Like the equilibrium always resets. You never get this point where everything is dominated by one side. Once people realize that one side is getting too much, if they're not getting enough love from the faction they're with, they're going to jump to the other faction. You could have a future in the next 10 years where the GOP is the home base of, let's say, uh, Jewish voters. And I know that sounds crazy right now, but imagine you get a Democratic Party in 10 or 20 years that is very, very, uh, let's say, anti-Israel. And you get a lot of these rich people that move over. You could get people like a... You could have like uh, gay factions, for instance, that move over to being GOP once evangelicals are small enough. And right. again, I know it's crazy right now, but this is how our politics well, always work. Yeah. Well, you already kind of see that with people like uh, Dave Rubin, so it's not that crazy. Yeah. I don't think that's going to get rid of the Electoral College, though. I think the Electoral College has more to do with geography than it does, you know, any one ideology just happening to attach itself to that. I think anyone who benefits from it in those certain ge- geographic areas are going to take it up just because it's obvious like where most of the votes are going to come from. If it's just like a straight, you know, tally of votes instead of some sort of system. Right. All, all I'm saying is that when you have a system like the electoral college, it forces equilibrium. So if you have this section where California, New York, Texas, and this swath of other States are all voting the same way, that won't last because you're not going to have a system where one party dominates the other side unless everybody in that coalition is super happy. If they get unhappy, you're going to have political realignments within these parties where people will jump ship because these other guys are going to give them something 
more than what they were getting from the faction they were with. And political realignments are very normal with us. It just doesn't feel like it because we're super polar- polarized right now. Mm-hmm. And that's all. And there's there's being arguments being made right now that we are currently realigning on a um, on somewhat of a class structure. Um, of course, it's too much white ethno nationalism attached to it, but um, the Democrats are becoming more of a professional class where that was the Republicans, you know, 50 years ago. So even, even uh, during the Bush years, I think, wasn't the whole college educated thing flipped around back then? So it's like college educators. Yeah, they've been trending Democrat over the last um I think ever since Bush, years. it's kind of been Democrat. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I'm saying that the trend was that you had a, a split between the college-educated voter, and now there's not so much of a split. Like the old working, the old working class used to be purely Democratic, and then cultural issues came into the forefront. And now some of them, well, like a good chunk of them, are now Republican. So, chat's talking a lot about COVID nineteen and the effect on the election. So, what do you guys think about that? Like, do you think that we're at a point right now where we have enough of a handle that the, the economy is going to recover and it's not going to affect things? Or how do you guys see this playing out? How the hell could the economy recover? I mean, Jared, well, we're right, should say right wing Pinocchio, says we're going to be rocking by the middle of July. Back to concerts and sports events. And, yeah, that's not happening. They made promises. No, of course it's not. They make promises that are not, there's no way they could be kept. Unless, you know, he wants to kill everybody. I I don't know if I, I do have some concern uh, about the um, the whole if the the economy starts to recover and it's not concern because we all want the economy to recover but we don't want Trump to get the credit for that happening considering he's been such inept of the whole thing um, with it so that's that's where my concern is um, but uh, I I just don't see the economy even really start to recover. You will see the stock market start to recover, and that's already been somewhat somewhat playing out because the stock market is looking to the future, and it's based on a whole bunch of, you know, feelings. Like that's what it boils down. It's feelings where they think the different policies are going to go. Fiscal stimulus actually coming into into effect, uh, monetary stimulus coming into effect. The fact that the the parties are actually saying, hey, you know, we need to get more small businesses money. That props up the economy by giving them money to spend stuff. So. Um, you might see some of those kind of things start to recover, but you're not going to see people going back to work. Tech, tech is going to stay out of work probably for the rest of the year. There's no reason for tech to go back to work. Like we're still say, working. They, they can the, afford it big time. Right. But, there, but there's no point for them to actually go and be in an office. Right. I, I right. honestly think that you'll see things like that become normal and you'll probably see some some real estate glut happening from that by a lot of companies going state and local full taxes remote, are going to suffer too from that going full remote and that's going to have compound impacts just like mateo just said still at a thousand like we haven't even gotten down to 1000 deaths a day right we're already almost at 66000 they've raised the projection now to 72000 we're going to hit 72000 by the middle of may and that's like a like a long time. It's probably going to happen before then. And we'll, we might even hit over 100K by the end of May with things uh-huh. starting to open we back up and people getting could. haircuts and yep. stuff. Because there's a lot of people out there that think that, um, you know, masks are like these foolproof ways because, well, everybody in Asia wore masks and they don't have very many problems, not knowing everything else that went with it, you know. Um, and so they, they they seem to think like, oh, it protects me. No, it lessens the, the chance, but you're getting your haircut, dude. Like, you're having your head touched, your face touched. Like, come on. <laughs> what about um, food shortages? Food shortages, excuse me. Um, that's being talked about a lot right now, too, is what, what is Oof. the future going to hold because of the issues with COVID-19 and meatpacking places? And farmers, they, they're starting to till or they have been tilling their fields um, under. I don't know if we'll actually see food shortages. I think what we're seeing is the uh, the impact of having the restaurant industry closed on Could the be. the. Well, we already uh, had a food shortage. I feel like. Well, we had a supply chain um, crunch, which caused a food shortage. They didn't really cause a shortage, though. Like everybody could still eat. 
like not everybody but um, you, you know what i mean general. for yeah, a couple of weeks even still it's there's a lot of stuff you can't get where you can't buy flaming hot doritos anywhere all right <laughs> But I, I need to uh, Trump. but there's a thing, uh, this was said in, in one, I don't remember what I was listening to, but there was one of the podcasts that I listened to on a regular basis. And they said that, uh, in the, the nineties, there was a, um, a recession hit and it caused, um, it caused supply supply chains and and grocery stores to reduce the amount of stock they keep on hand from, uh, three months on hand to like four weeks four or five weeks on hand and so what we saw was a, a panic go through and crunch the current supplies but those have since been re-implemented those have since been restocked for the most part um at least in my experience um the talk about the whole meat shortage thing is i don't know two weeks before they said we got a hundred we got a hundred million pounds of frozen chicken on hand to like feed everybody and now they're like oh no we can't get chicken to anybody because we have to follow safety regulations and i'm just like come on but they're killing yeah, it's, them. A, it's I mean, gonna be like a temporary stop yeah it's not gonna be but like who a, knows how long that temporary is going to be i mean if they're i mean if they were running this pigs, whole time they're gonna go back if yeah, they were running this whole time i feel what, like what, they're not gonna stop now what we'll see is probably a reduction in the amount of uh output you'll probably see a you know, twenty percent, thirty percent capacity. Um, assuming higher prices. It, yeah, you'll see maybe some higher prices. Um, I don't think it will be an actual shortage. But early wrong asked, why are farmers destroying their crops? Because there's nobody to pick them because of the uh, there's the lockdowns and the shutdowns. And there's less there's less demand for it because restaurants right. are not ordering. Well, except restaurants that the demand have a thing. huge for the same reason why Saudi likes to cut oil production sometimes. Yeah. it's it's pricing stuff. But if you because the amount of food waste we have in this country, this could be a whole other uh, uh, topic, uh, podcast topic, um, is immense. It's like billions of pounds of food a year. Horrible. And it's a lot of stuff is because of we we expect to go to a restaurant and be fed as soon as we get there. We go to buffets where they just constantly have food rotating out and you can't keep it uh, out there the whole time. You have buffets, to throw it away. So Buffets are going to be like a thing of the past. They'll be like drive-ins from when I was, you know, people, I say drive-ins now, they're like, what the hell is a drive-in? Buffets? But, what the hell is a buffet? Because they're going to be gone. <laughs> True. But we have been streaming now for two hour, about two hours and ten minutes. Um, we will be having another episode on Sunday at 6 p.m. Eastern standard time uh actually i'll double check on that time uh it might be 7 p.m eastern standard time but uh, it is a pre-show for our podcast recording where we will talk about news related topics that um and you know touch base from the last time that we were live for a pre-show so tomorrow we'll be able to get into all these news related to articles and top or news related topics um such as you know food shortages that we're talking about now allegations against biden the whole nine yards um so if that's something that you're interested in Please be sure to tune us in at this channel here on Twitch, Crowdsource Politics, or twitch.tv slash crowdsource politics. Do we have any All last your questions? Comments, guys. Thank you very Do much. Yes, thank you guys. Is there any last questions before we go ahead and wrap this up? Who's the woman? Oh, uh, <laughs> it's Adams. Nic Nicoletta Adams. Nikki, yes, Nikki, Nicolette. Nikki, sorry. That's me. My beauty is so great, it must be hidden. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I will do. We had to uh, veil her face for the show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I will do uh, better to get the, the names up and lighting up while we talk so that we can have names to faces, faces to names. Um, for the next one, that was an oversight on my, my, my part here. Video should be required. Yeah, I can't force people to be on video if they, uh, yeah, so. I, yeah. I could be a spy, I could work for the CIA, it might be the FBI, no such agency. That could be why you're not seeing my face. For sure. M yeah. Matt Treywick disappears and Nikki shows up, <laughs> wins <laughs> 
Well, everybody, thank you so much for joining us today. We had about 15, 15 to 20 people again on our sh on in the chat. Uh, so we greatly appreciate that. Oh, uh, last question. When will the baseball season start? America Love Story is out May 8th. Sorry to have to plug. I don't listen to hip hop. <laughs> Uh, but uh, thank you guys so much for joining us if you did like us please be sure to share us with your friends um, comment and subscribe and as always keep your head up through a political storm